Hey, I'm Matt. Welcome to my podcast, The Imagining, a time to explore the imagination, creativity, and mental health. All of the conversations I'm having form part of the research for my new book. I hope that you have the opportunity during this time to discover something new about yourself. So, uh, my man, thank you so much for coming. We met this year, not that long ago, just before uh, we embarked on a massive spoken word stage um, production that we were doing at a big, big mm. festival. Is that how you would describe yourself? Spoken word artist? I'm happy to be described as that. I'm, um, my full-time profession is I'm a youth and community worker, but since the age of 18, I've been writing and trying to, well, thinking a lot about communication, but particularly through poetry and spoken word. Um, in the last few years, I've actually really wanted to learn more about written like page poetry. But yeah, I'm happy to be called a spoken word poet, a poet, a writer. And yeah, like I say, youth and community worker and first aid trained mental health um, first aid as well. And I've got a few other strings to my uh, my LinkedIn bow. But you can, you can bow. find me online. Bro, okay, that's good. What are the kind of components of who you are? What, what makes you, you? Wow, that's like a deep vast ocean um i mean i am i'm a i'm a product of of my upbringing obviously products a little bit clinical but um a bit capitalist but i think i think <laughs> with my family being you know it's a big part of who i am is being part of the mitchell tribe um one of five children who grew up in a community house of 25 people in bristol so my early years from 5 to 20 were really shaped by living with loads of different people so that kind of family person community like being around lots of different personalities and and cultures and ways of doing life um and that also ties in with like faith so um both parents quite active in their following of jesus and trying to learn how to live the spiritual life in reality um so that was all part of my upbringing and i'd say another big part of who i am is is around like music and film and also around football um, big part of my identity playing talking watching um, I've always been a performer from a young age making silly faces again taking opportunities to to make people laugh but um, I'm also uh, a very internal introspective person who likes to uh, spend time on my own and get lost in in those worlds so yeah all those kind of components of being quite out there but being quite inward um sometimes too navel gazing and i'm also a big part of my last five years is meeting gabriella who i'm getting married to in four weeks so four yeah four weeks bro this oh, is, yeah so this is this is some of the some of the big headlines um but this yeah is serious stuff man this is serious stuff you're one of the most fascinating people i've ever met <laughs> Come on. very kind i do take that as a compliment i do um i think that you have a wonderful gift of with words to help articulate things maybe that are cloaked in mystery i wonder if today <laughs> we can go on a little bit of a journey about uncloaking the mystery of the imagination um and putting some words to that so just as like an overarching broad big picture how do you kind of understand humans imagination creativity um and even maybe if you wanted to touch on the, the mental health bit and how you see them relate into one another i think for me i would understand um i would understand this as being just a really a really like private but yeah like really powerful component to being human in in that we live our lives amongst other people, but we spend so much of our lives in our mind and, and in all these different lands. And I, I kind of don't necessarily have the technical language for it, but I think since I was young, I mean, I used to play on my own in my imagination for several hours each day, you know, and without a console or a TV, we didn't have a lot of like visual stimulation. We had some great books and tapes, but for me, I kind of found that was a place of play and of, maybe escapism um and safety and dreaming but it was it was it was somewhere that i plugged into every day 
So from a young child, um, the imagination land was like very part of my reality. And then as I've got older, it's continued to be something that I draw on. Um, as I've learned more about the mind, and I have, I am very interested in the mind and in, and in mental health and in psychology. I don't have accreditation, but I think um, I'm learning that, um, yeah, this this place is is also a place that can be quite vulnerable. Um, and I think that's where, uh, most, most, a lot of battles are thought, but thought or thought, but, um, I've drifted from your question cause it's quite overwhelming. No, um, no, no, not at all. Not at it, all. It, I, I think you're alluding to something which is really helpful. Have you ever considered that something like anxiety and the creation of beauty and beautiful things maybe sits along some spectrum mm. or is maybe produced from the same place within us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I did a theology degree and um, my theological and spiritual journey is always evolving. And uh, yeah, there've been a few big bang moments, but <laughs> a lot of the time uh, I, I can't tell you exactly where I am, but I know that um, I have found so much um, comfort and clarity from studying um or listening to people who have thought a lot about philosophy and, and the meaning of texts like um, the Genesis story, which I love. I love that as a creative person, the idea of God speaking, you know, spoken word. And, 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 and I also had an incredible lecture on the image of God, which um, was the idea that humans were created to bear all the creator's, you know, identity, which is lots of things, including like relational, the idea of God being re relational and um, the idea of, you know, personality, sensuality, um, creativity. And one of the things about this lecture that I remember so clearly to this day was the idea that um, all those things can become tarnished or fallen or broken or marred. And he used the example of, um, you know, the same humans that can create the art and the music that we love can create gas chambers and weapons. And it that really like, hit me in terms of um the potential to create you know and at the same time like all those other attributes is there and maybe as a as a kind of part of our identity bearing the image of the divine and then where we go with that it can just be such a a, a spectrum so yeah i think um even i'm um, going back to the idea of worry anxiety and depression and and some of the the really vulnerable, the vulnerable places, I believe that, um, yeah, that there's a, all of us will have a, a spectrum of experience. And yeah, I think the conditions we're, we're around, the environments we're in can really affect those as well. Um, and that's another thing I draw on from my childhood was being encouraged to, to be in the imagination and to play. Um, and when I think about childhoods or environments where that is repressed or crushed or, you know, or where people have been victims to like uh, power abuse. I just think, I don't know what, what that can do to our minds. Um, it's just gonna be really terrifying. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, what's like, I mean, I'm sure it's daily. I mean, it is mm. for me, this constant wrestling motion between, you know, your imagination is like one of them sushi restaurants <laughs> where, where the sushi comes round on yeah, like yeah. the conveyor belt and it just keeps coming yeah and it just keeps coming and like some of the stuff is like oh that looks great i'll have one of them and yeah. some of the stuff is like what the flip is that like that just that looks weird mm. and like no way am i eating mm. that um you know for you how does it kind of play itself out do you feel like it is this ocean of unending waves this sushi bar of unending meal options like what does it feel like for you what the imagination yeah and, yeah i mean it's changed a lot I, as i said i used to plug in it was it was like my console i'd plug into a game be it world war one be it winning the world cup be it just another life that i imagined robin hood whatever that was um like a choice and it was almost like informed by external stimuli and i think um again i i you know i know that from a psychology uh, psychological point of view um, what we dwell on what we meditate on becomes more vivid for us doesn't it and more um, it can then it can influence our actions and so I think um, there's obviously what, what our diet is 
I believe has a, has a correlation to what we imagine. But I also think, and it's interesting to think about children in this. And again, when you maybe have had less stimulation or like less like to, to work with quote unquote, what people conjure up. I think for me, um, I find that sometimes, yeah, sometimes quite like quite shocking things can come into my mind and quite um, alarming things or things that I feel a bit like scared of, um, as well as all the other mundane things and the beautiful things. I think one point is that I'd want to raise is just not to be like as afraid of those things that they come in and they're almost, yeah, they're almost just, I don't know, somewhere in our subconscious or some yeah. some place that, that um, when they pass through, the, not being as alarmed as maybe I was when I was younger. Um, but I do believe, um, for me, uh, it's also sad how sometimes my imagination feels like it gets a bit dulled and I actually find that um, now there's more of a kind of active quest to get myself into places where it can be sparked. Um, whereas maybe as a child, it was it was kind of, there was a lot running through. I think that the, the analogy of the fire is a really nice one in the sense that, you know, we can, if our imaginations are like a fire, mm. you know, they do take nourishment in a mm. sense to keep going. Um, I, although I guess in another way they're nothing like fire in the sense that they they will you know even if you pay no attention yeah. to it it will be it will just knock on sometimes keep going regardless yeah because you're making me think like obviously like when we talk in the abstract well not obviously I get quite lost in the abstract I'm like oh gosh but I'm trying to think like today even like where where's your imagination gone and like where's yeah. mine gone like what <laughs> what like, have, have you yeah, have exactly, you can yeah. you can you think like today what what's been happening or has it been has there been just too much of a to-do list with all this yeah i mean what what was your experience of today in terms of that that kind of imagination yeah uh, i mean it's a weird it's a bit of a like a meta thing isn't it it's like mm. you're talking about the imagination what were you imagining mm. whilst mm. talking about the imagination i i just wonder whether for me there's a sense of in my own walk, in my own life, I think with my own mental health, I guess, there's always been this constant reality of like um, that sushi bar analogy of it just keeps serving up ideas mm -hmm. and things and they're not always like really enjoyable thoughts, you know. Um, not always. Not say. always, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think obviously like today, the the predominant activity of imagination was why are you doing this? This mm. is stupid. This is a waste of time. Okay. Um, clearly no one wants to hear your thoughts. Clearly I'm, I don't even want to hear my thoughts in, you know, it's, it's, that's been the main activity of my mm. imagination on a day, which is supposedly like this creative mm. adventure, which some people might go, Oh wow, this is the, this is really like so creative. Like what great conversations and they might think they're terrible, but, um, <laughs> the the real like depth of my imagination today has been much more on a journey of this is not a good idea so to mm. speak and and even if it is a good idea you're not good enough for the idea so that's actually been the activity of my imagination mm. you know there's so much of an ebb and flow when it comes to our creativity and mm. our thought life you know where sometimes yeah this was a a picture of me trying to create something beautiful. This mm. this very conversation mm. was a uh, me trying to go out of my way to create something beautiful. Mm. Um, but you know, at the same time, it's my imagination is seeing the opportunity for catastrophe in amongst the beauty. Mm. And I, I guess that feels so true every time we try and create something beautiful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks for your honesty on that. And I think. Um obviously for anyone listening, that'll be a reality. I, I guess I, I would be curious and maybe this is, is not the, not the path you want to go down, but in terms of like where those thoughts come from or how regular those are, or do you have a balance of other th creative thoughts that say, oh no, you're, you have got, you know, really good stuff to bring in. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, it goes, up in up in levels and mm. like in times of stress yeah 
although not only in times of stress, obviously them like intrusive thoughts about, yeah. you know, um, really raise their head um, mm. and really start battering you sometimes. Yeah. You know, it can be like a full on onslaught of thoughts, which are, you know, make you really freak out and make you really feel like, you know, that you're just not a good person or mm. that you're like really a waste of space. Mm. Um, although traditionally it's one of the weird, it's, it's sad in a way because you, you often become more attentive or I become more attentive to my imagination and what it's doing when it's bad things as opposed to when I'm maybe feeling like I'm on the pursuit of doing something mm. creative, whether that be making a cake, saying something nice to my wife or, or something that maybe we see more traditionally as yeah. creativity and beautiful things like art. Um, you know, I seemingly I maybe pay less attention when I'm trying to do them beautiful things than I do when yeah. my imagination is serving up scary thoughts like, what will happen if I get diagnosed with cancer mm. because I've got a sore throat, you know? Yeah. And that's the, my imagination, I guess in some ways overreacting to a sore throat. Um, so that feels like that's the, the full spectrum switch across of like all of that. And I think that they're the, you know, that fire analogy It's like that fire is crackling away sometimes it's just the embers just dull and it's not really doing anything and but sometimes like that imagination that's scary mm. is like a full lit fire mm. and sometimes you've got to dull it down a little bit although interestingly again exploring this in some of the writing i'm doing where it's you don't want to dull it so completely that you're unaware of danger exactly um and in the same way you don't want to over egg a fire of beauty and become so concerned with making beautiful things mm. in inverted commas um mm. that you lose sight of reality you know there's dangers at both ends of that mm. that spectrum i i see and observe the role of people like poets in our communities as this role of speaking to the bits which you know doctors scientists can't quite get to you know they can maybe tell us stuff about our bodies and even maybe help us explore our minds mm. but i feel like poets almost are like healers of the heart in a way how do you see that your work dulls the flames of anxiety or lights the fires of beauty yeah, it's, it's, it's a lovely affirmation of poets. And I do believe there is something in many of the art art forms that, that plays a role of healing. And I think um, one of the obvious things that I think people sense is um, the acknowledgement of, of emotion. I mean, the thing that people would say to poets time and time again, or to writers, and, and they have said to me, but I'm sure to many people is, Oh, that's something I felt that you, you know, you really, you really articulated it. And that's obviously as a human, we're, we're made for community. We are made to be part of something bigger. So the idea of not feeling alone, which I think isolation is where, you know, molehills become mountains, you know, mental molehills become huge and, and overwhelming and, you know, drive people to all sorts of places. So the idea that something is spoken, um, can actually mean you know that, that that kind of spell is broken and i believe that um that's one of the really beautiful roles of poets is to speak the unspeakable or, or the, the things that are hard to speak um or just have an attempt at that and then you know sometimes that's just actually allows someone to start finding words and having the courage to find words because a lot of us haven't learned how to put words to emotions or feelings and i believe that whether you call yourself a writer or a poet or not, we all kind of need to find that language mm. for ourselves. But by hearing other people is how we learn to talk, isn't it? And and how to, to articulate. This is the, the really interesting crossover of being someone that works both in like a highly artistic space of 
poetry and mm. spoken word, but also works in the very earthy landscape of South East London. Do you see, do they, do they speak to each other then? They do. I mean, I, I just find that as someone who like communicates through writing, that I want to bring that into everything I do. And I don't always bring it into everything I do as explicitly as you might imagine. But um, f- funnily enough, we had a mental health training um, just before the summer for staff. So my team, the kind of well-being team, were delivering various trainings. And I'd done a little bit on um, looking after yourself and I'd done a little bit on opening conversations with young people. But really what I wanted to try and do was to try and summarise some of the stuff from the day in a poem to close. And actually that was probably the first time to like, all staff that I'd been that I'd done that even in three years even I'd done a few bits online but that felt um that felt like a lovely coming together of those things and really in in all my kind of time doing community work I've wanted to bring in that you know I've spent time with people one-on-one in almost like a I'm not going to say counseling because that's I'm not a counselor but we offer counsel don't we as a friend or as a guide yeah. and sharing poems with people individually that I think are right be it my own or someone else's so I definitely see the crossover and you know so much of what I write about is obviously well all of what I write about is rooted in the reality that I experience with some fantasy I think one thing that you said as well um, going back to the idea of inspiring um, so I think when we when we use our words and when we speak hard things and name things it can bring comfort and help people feel less alone and maybe find courage to seek help or to start to articulate things and as you acknowledged, it also can light something in people. And I, I, you know, I love the idea that when we hear someone else or watch someone else do something, it just has this beautiful, sometimes just like the spark just gets passed. And, you know, there are so many people that have started writing. Well, everyone who started writing is normally because someone else was writing and they loved it. So I think that, um, yeah, the role of anyone who does anything is partly to, to help inspire someone else to do that thing. And, you know, there's a lot of areas in my life where I really lack confidence, e.g. the kitchen. So I need to be around (laughs) chefs or people, not just chefs, just just everyday people who cook a good carbonara and actually go, yeah, what are you doing? Okay, boom, I can take that and um, try and have a go at that and and maybe, and then in due time, pass that on. Because I guess that's the, the gift of like, I mean, like so many other things, the gift of creativity. Um, and being someone who has an imagination and someone that can create out of seemingly like separated parts, mm. you know, it's a responsibility, isn't it? To then leave that legacy onto mm. the people around us. Have you considered yourself to be someone that does that? Like, is there certain things that you would kind of say, oh, this is a really like surefire way of inspiring in someone? an ability to create beauty where where before mm. you acted all they would see is their ability to live in chaos mm. no it's a lovely question and i think you know the, the key thing i'd want to communicate to us and to anyone listening is actually questions and being asked questions is sometimes the best way of inviting that and what you did by sending me some questions about this conversation they inspired my imagination it's really lovely to be taught something in a very practical way like you know i'd call that kind of mentoring where i you know going back to the carbonara you show me okay this is what you do but sometimes to be dared to ask the question um you know what would you create what would you what's your response to this question is is actually one of the best things that we can do for people and i mean i'm i've also got a little a little well of strong interest in coaching which is about questions and letting people find um, the answers within and I think uh, we have a lot we have a lot of us who struggle to trust ourselves and our instincts and if we're invited to ask questions and given space and uh, you know um, encouragement sometimes we can really discover so much without needing any other help at the same time I believe that um, it's also really helpful to see models and you know to be uh, to be given you know examples and, and workshops mm. But I know that, um, yeah, just going back to that, you asking me these questions has brought things out that, um, yeah, have been like really helpful. So I think that's something that we can do for each other. Do you think that works in both in both ways as well? Like, do you think that that speaks to the anxiety and to the creation of beauty? Or do you feel like 
you need to treat them differently? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I, I know some, ah, uh, it's really tricky with anxiety and with the vulnerable places in our minds. Cause sometimes what we need most is a bit of distraction or we need to be held or we need a comforting words. And again, um, many other things that, that, that might soothe us. But I, I believe, I probably believe I'm testing out that the kind of the wound unexamined goes unhealed. So being, I'm sure someone said that, but, um, <laughs> if not, then no, 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 no. someone did say that. that. <laughs> I, someone said it, but I can't remember who, sorry. But I think, um, I know for me in my own journey in the last year doing therapy have been, it's been so helpful to ask the why of the what's behind the yeah. fear. And so I think on a, on a crude, on a crude answer, I would say, um, yeah, the question being invited to explore probably is applicable, but then, um, individuals are different yeah. and yeah, need, yeah. need different things. But I think, um, I, I, I believe I'm testing that out. As a, yeah. As a theory. I mean, I guess like it's, it's certainly true to say that in either scenario, whether you're trying to speak to anxiety or the creation of beauty, like safety is safety. a really safety important yes. factor, isn't it? Yes. Like in all of these conversations, particularly in a time such as this, where so our mental health as a generation is under some threat, whether mm. that's unique to us living now, or whether, you know, it kind of has rid its head every mm. hundred years forever. It's certainly true to say that safety is like a fundamental if you're going to empower someone and inspire someone. Because it's it's interesting, even when I've had people come up to me before and say like, oh, like, it's really cool how you broke away from having a full-time job that you didn't love to doing your own thing and having a bit of a part-time job over there and um, making films and writing books and the full spectrum. But the reality is, is that my creativity thrived because my parents and my family and my friends created a, you know, a safe place for me to take the risk. And I think that's really like substantially more important than, than we think is that sometimes mm -hmm. it's just it's not safe enough for us to take the risk of creating beautiful things or not safe enough for us to dull the fires of anxiety, you know, because you, that is so true. I mean, what you've said there is like, that's like, yeah, that's the gold. Cause everything I've said is void without, without safety, without that. And I, I experienced that in my youth work and in my relationships and in myself, like feeling, you know, even in this conversation, feeling affirmed by you having had a couple of chats, you know, I feel, even though I said to you, there's aspects of doing this chat that can feel like a test or could be quite vulnerable mm. in my mind. Um, and I might go away and replay things and, 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 but actually the safety of this context holds that. And I've, I've seen that time and time again with myself, you know, the last few months I've been part of a community called the right club, shout out Joshua Luke Smith and all those who are involved in that. And again, even that space for writers creating a place of affirmation, safety, that's just built in me a confidence that I, I've had confidence before, but just another layer of confidence, you know, even doing the, the big church fest, again, another layer of confidence. And this confidence, when we're in safe environments, it's almost like it reinforces mm. you are safe. You can, you can create, you can grow, you can heal. And I, yeah. I, I know that um, there's people in my life that have got real vulnerabilities in their mental health and they probably they maybe don't feel safe enough yet to actually explore that in a way that others of us would like them to. And I've seen that with young people as well as peers. And I believe, that, um, yeah, you've just, you've hit them, you've hit them the nail on the head without that safety. Um, I don't know. I mean, people do create in, in absolute chaos, don't they? And they yeah. create in. Well, in and, it, cause and, I think in another sense, like, you know, chaos is almost like the building blocks of order anyway, isn't it? Is <laughs> you know, good. before every sense of order, there has to be a sense of chaos mm. for all, because it's like chaos is the disparate random pieces of, of new things. Mm. You know, every creation story of every faith, you know, it, somewhere within that is rooted the idea of something was chaotic, it was formless, and then you know, it order got brought to mm. it and something 
potentially beautiful was made. So I think that it's, you know, to say that our lives are within chaos is an important fact of creating beautiful things because, you know, it's the journey of humankind is this yeah. constant movement between this was chaotic, something beautiful got made. Mm. And then it does feel like it's just like rinse and repeat the process Cycle. a little bit in our Cycles. lives. Where it's just like, oh great, I'm in the chaos again. Mm. Is there something beautiful I can do? Mm. And I guess as part of our responsibility for, for all of us as humans is that either we're doing it ourselves and we're trying to create beautiful things out of chaotic moments. Um, and I don't mean beautiful things in the like um, throwaway sense, beautiful things as in genuine moments of connection, mm. generosity, or being able to be still in a moment. Mm. Like I, I use beautiful as a, as a big word, not just like mm. a beautiful painting, for example. Mm. But we've either got the responsibility to be the creators of beauty out of chaos or the responsibility of being a safe place for someone else so that they can do it. That's so good. That's that's profound. And I just say, well done, well said. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Clap to you. <laughs> that's really cool. And so... Let's just touch on just one more point before we finish. Um, where did you get your dungarees from? <laughs> Lucy and Yak, mate. Bro, they kicked, kicked me out since four years ago. Since four years. One pair, two pairs? Two pairs. Two pairs. They just opened a shop in Bristol, so go check them out. And then these, these ones are from Brighton. And I don't know if there's one in London. Uh, I don't think there is. So oh, Bristol okay. or Brighton or maybe other places. Unofficial sponsor, I guess. <laughs> dungarees. <laughs> from Lucy and Yak. And I'll say this about dungarees for anyone listening and to you. You're not a dungarees wearer till you wear dungarees. Just like you're not a hat wearer till you Ooh, wear hats. Just like damn. you're not a poet till you tell someone you're a poet. That's crazy. Before we leave, would you like to impart any remaining wisdom in the tank? I mean, I feel like we're just getting into it. So I'm, I'm sad to be ending because there's so many other things that in my mind sad in a good way. Um, there's so many other things that I think are important to say about creativity and imagination. I mean, I'm not going to try and, well, I am going to try and reel off some stuff <laughs> that try, we could yeah. talk about. Hit me, hit and me, just, hit me with the, with the highlights that we I haven't mean, covered. And, I mean, and we, part two is always available. You know, I just, I just found it interesting thinking for myself about this before coming to see you about like intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and how it's so good to get external stimulation. Like we all imitate, don't we? And we all copy and that's how we learn. Sometimes moving away from external stimulation and just finding kind of boredom or places that feel like more like a kind of blank wall. And um, I just I just want to encourage people to to find the balance and, and, and encourage myself to keep finding the balance because I also like anyone who does anything and particularly in this social media age, I get drawn into envy and the obvious stuff of comparison. And in the right doses, looking at other people's work does so much for me. Like it, like I'm going to a gig tonight to be inspired to write and to perform. Um, and in the, like when it's chosen, it's so good. But when it's just like constant, and if you're constantly plugged into other people's stuff, I don't think it's helpful. I know rappers or musicians who don't listen to anyone else's stuff, and I find that really interesting. Because for me, like when I'm on my own. And let's just say I'm outside or I'm walking or I'm in a calf or when I'm just kind of left with a bit more of what I would call like internal, but clears loads of external stimulation. I just love what comes out in those spaces. And mm -hmm. I know that for me, when I'm flowing between those two places is so good for my imagination because, um, yeah, I, we kind of need, we need both, I believe. So that was, that was just one of the thoughts I wanted to throw out and, and wondered if you, if you relate to that at all, or if you, connect with the idea of the extrinsic and intrinsic external internal yeah i i guess that often we leap off of other things don't we you know we, what, um, leap off of other things yeah um you know in that book that i've got sitting in my suitcase just over there um you know tolkien writes about the idea of like the tree of ideas all ideas and all stories mm. are rooted in this like base of one tree and all stories come from this one tree of stories and they they filter down and i guess in part 
like that external stimulation, that external inspiration is like that tree. We can't disconnect ourselves from everything and everyone. We are part of this world. And mm. um, that's a beautiful thing. But taking the time to let something unravel itself within us so that our uniqueness through both our uniqueness both through our dna and mm. that kind of biological sense but our uniqueness as in we've lived our own life with our own story mm. and that's completely unique in that way as well and let these stories these ideas these stimuluses wherever they come from unravel and speak to us in a way that uniquely meshes with our life mm. and our experiences if we walk past things um recognizing the effect that all of the you know even like the windows that are behind you or the advertising on the tube on the way here or the smell of the sandwich shop down the road if you if we um recognize the fact that all of these things are being put in then there's so much chance for our imaginations and our internals just to be doing stuff that we're just completely unaware of and we have to live with our imaginations right yeah so you like part of it as well is that protecting ourselves from the junk food of yes. stimulus well this you've you've just hit i mean again i i just uh, i feel like you hit something you hit something on the head there because the junk food is probably what i'm referring to um and maybe not trusting ourselves and i'm i remember when i was having a conversation with a writer and i went to the toilet and i was so inspired by the chat i thought i'm not going to do the obvious thing which is check my phone I'm going to look at the toilet door and imagine something into being. And it's weird because I didn't really, um, I'm not really an interior designer, but I suddenly saw like a great concept for a toilet door with like a snake being like the hook that you hang your clothes on. Copyright, Joey. Um, and this was like, I was so excited because I was like, oh, maybe I'll create that in the future. But it was weird because I almost like, it was so intentional. I was like, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to try and imagine, imagine. into being yeah, something. Yeah. And even this morning, you know, I, I looked at like, slug trails on the ground and i like just normally would zoom past that i just paused and was like that's like imagine like slug graffiti what would that look like and seeing and again just the play and like i was lucky that i had a bit of space to play and i think you know the, the observer the you know to be a poet you've got to be an observer to be to yeah. be creative you've got to be able to look at the world and but like even just say, to be just to be human, just to be human you've got to observe you've got to like take it in you've got to like realize what you're putting into you realize and like understand its nutritional value in a sense Ooh. because everything is having an effect on us at some level and some of these things that we notice are really like slug trails like come on man that's beautiful <laughs> no you've you said it so well and i, I think um, i know you probably need to finish but i think one one thing that um coming full circle is like I've appreciated you've really affirmed me the time I've met you as someone who you know to take to take my craft seriously I feel you know take words seriously you need to kind of hear it from from someone that you recognize as safe or as or as you know encouraging so that that is a lovely gift and I think hopefully something that um this whole series will do for people is help them along that journey of kind of discovering what they have and, and being more confident to to bring it out amazing thank you so much for uh coming to this white room and joyful. uh sharing your ideas and your thoughts on the imagination and creativity and mental health and for being vulnerable and um genuinely i think that the words that you speak are of so much value and um yeah where can people find more of your work I mean, at the moment, I'm just doing stuff on the, the named David underscore poetry Instagram, which is where I try and share a bit of written and spoken. So that's the place to connect. Um, there's something on YouTube under a similar name, named David, but Instagram is probably the place. Um, and then in real life, catch me around East. <laughs> yeah, catch you around East. All right, boss. Thanks right. so much, bro. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. And to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this episode of The Imagining. I hope that you've had the opportunity to discover something new about yourself. If you wouldn't mind and you enjoyed listening, then I would be really appreciative if you subscribed on whatever channel you're listening on.